Hi. Hi. Welcome to our seventh DLD Think Show. I'm Steffi, the founder of DLD of the DLD conference, and I'm proud to see you all now listening to two outstanding speakers. Welcome to our seventh DLD Think Show with Margaret Heffernan and Nikki Kolev. I met Margaret at the TED summit in in um, somewhere in Scotland, Edinburgh, and I was impressed about her unconventional, smart, tough thinking with lots of humor and um, many insights concerning modern leadership. She is an amazing author. She's a businesswoman. I just heard that she's building up a farm, um, farming supply chain now in this area, in, in this time of COVID to help the farmers. And uh, I like her, I just like her. And I wanted to share her great personality with you, dear audience. And she will be um, talking with Nikki Golev, my old friend, Nikki, who I'm, from whom I learned so much in terms of businesses. He is the managing director of WeWork in Central Europe and Northern Europe. But he's not only this, he's also an outstanding entrepreneur. He is a smart investor in over 40, 40 companies. And um, you can learn a lot of him in terms of smartness, humanness, and humor. This will be an exciting talk. Thank you for the two of you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Steffi. Margaret, hi, it's so great to be on with you. Yeah. Let's start with an easy question, maybe. If you look back the last 8, 10, 12 weeks, what have we learned from this crisis? <laughs> well, I hope we've learned, and I hope we won't forget, that um, uncertainty is always with us. I think that in the last 10 or 20 years, we've been very seduced by this idea that with enough data, we can predict everything. And when we can predict everything, we can control everything. And then, you know, planetary domination is ours, in essence. And you know, I've been thinking about this for quite a long time. And as you know, just before the lockdown, I brought down, a, I brought out a book that said, actually, a huge amount of life is unpredictable. It will remain unpredictable. Uncertainty was, is always going to be with us. And we need to start accepting that and learn how to work with it instead of, um, you know, just try to deny that it exists or that we can master it. So I have a deep vested interest, you know, as well as a deep philosophical conviction that uncertainty is an absolutely defining quality in life and we should stop fighting it and learn how to make it our friend. So let's, let's pretend you and I were winemakers. <laughs> if we were winemakers, we would be talking about vintages. Right. And let's work with the hypothesis because we're positive and optimistic that 2020 post-COVID 2020, 2021 will be a fantastic vintage. What are the ingredients besides learning to accept and actually tolerate and, and be comfortable with uncertainty? What are the ingredients that our vintage would, would have, would need to have? So I think if you were absolutely convinced, I'd be a little scared. Um, if you had good reason to believe that it was likely, I would be less scared. I would urge you to think seriously about what the probability of it being a great vintage would be. And if you turned out to be right, what the immediate consequences of your business for your business right now would be. So if we accept your hypothesis that it's going to be a great vintage, it's going to be 1961 all over again, then I'd say, okay, so let's think about in that case, how do you want to store it? How do you want to market it? How quickly do you want to sell it or not? Um, what are you going to do if you turn out to be right? And then I'd say, and you'd feel great about that. Then you would like me probably a little bit less when I said, but, you know, probabilities are, I don't know, 60%, 70%. You know, a lot's going to depend on the weather. Uh, we can't do long range weather forecasting, so you don't know. 
So let's figure out a couple of other possibilities. What are the other scenarios where it's an ordinary year or it's a really bad year um, or it's a really bad year for certain kinds of grapes or certain kind of styles of wine? In those different scenarios, what's your plan? Now, um, at that point, you're going to be annoyed with me because you're going to have to do a lot of work, which you'd prefer not to do. And you'll think that some of it's going to be wasted, which will be true. And you may well be really addicted to efficiency, in which case wasting time really annoys you. But I'm going to do this because actually what I care about, if I care about you and your business, is I care not so much about your planning, which I already know you're good at. But what I really want to focus on now is are you prepared in case you're wrong? Because I hope you're right. But I also know that when you're talking about the future, you know, the very, 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 very best forecasters think that they can, with a great deal of effort, um, predict maybe 400 days out. But actually, ordinary, in ordinary educated people, it's closer to 150 days out. And you're talking about something really volatile like wine and weather. So maybe even shorter than that. So the risk of so the risk of making a mistake is pretty high. And the impact of a mistake for you is very high. So you need to do the extra work to be prepared because otherwise being too comfortable, being too certain could absolutely devastate your business. How do we how do we we are staying in the business? We're shifting, we're shifting to, to other to leader. other leader. Look, what I see right now is when I talk to companies coming back to work, I see two tools. One school of leaders who say they don't speak at all. You can see that they're scared. They're, they don't have a playbook. They don't know what's happening. And they don't know yeah. what they should do. So how yeah. do we interact with this type mm -hmm. of school? How do we help people in leadership to unlearn old <laughs> patterns? to yeah. unlearn old habits, old habits. Yeah. And to unlearn things that really made them successful in order to, in order to, to learn yeah. what it takes so, to be successful in the new world. So I think I'm seeing something similar to what you're seeing, which is I'm seeing a lot of leaders who are basically thinking, how do we get back to where we were? And you know, this has just been an interruption. Let's get back to where we were. And they they want they just want to get back in their comfort zone. You know, on some level, I can't you know I can't blame them, except that we're not where we were. And the way I often think about this is, you know, everything in your refrigerator doesn't fit your recipe, but you're still going ahead with the recipe, right? And you're making some substitutes, and this is going to be and this is going to end up tasting terrible. Because actually what you want to make and with the ingredients available to you are profoundly misaligned. The better thing to do is open up your refrigerator and say, what have we got? What are the assets we have in terms of people, in terms of cash, in terms of IP, in terms of relationships, in terms of supply chain, in terms of our workforce? What's the whole array of assets we have? What is the state of the world and where is the fit? And what's really interesting is I'm working with a couple of organizations at the moment that have used this pause to step back and say, actually, a lot of the things that we used to be doing, let's just chuck those out because this other stuff that we could be doing now, it's so much more valuable and it's going to catapult us ahead. And it's stuff we always meant to do, but actually let's do it now. And actually quite interestingly here in the UK, in the National Health Service, I do a, a, quite a lot of work with them. The crisis has made them more collaborative and more innovative under pressure than they've ever been allowed to be in the past. And they love it. It's like all this stuff that we thought would take a multi-billion pound transformation program over years. You know, like we did it in a week. <laughs> Please, can we stay here? Please, can we stay not siloed, not looking after targets and KPIs and all this nonsense, but actually really working together, doing work that matters and that the public really appreciates. So I think this is a phenomenal opportunity for companies if they have the guts, really, 
to dig deep and say, what have we got that really matters to the world today? Let's focus on that. Let's, let's also help the younger generation. Once uh, Napoleon said to understand the man, you have to know what was happening in the world when they were 20. And I see a lot of young people, young people who are right now really asking themselves, what have I learned and what am I going to do now? Well, I think the really sad thing is, I suspect a lot of the stuff they learned at school, sorry, kids, will turn out not to have been that useful. Learning to be a good soldier, follow the rules, tick the boxes, get the right answer that your boss wants may not be very helpful. And actually what's going to be really interesting is your boss may be looking to you to be the adaptive one. And I think for a lot of kids, of course, this could be a moment of glory. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot, because I, my daughter who works in theater is at home because all the theater is closed. And she's running this mammoth um, multimedia poetry project, which she had started before, but, you know, did in her spare time. And now she's at it full bore with a big team of people who love doing it. And she's learning more in her lockdown than I suspect she ever learned at university, to be honest. And she's learning more about managing a team and collaboration than she would le learn in a lifetime of MBAs. So I think the really important thing for young people at this exact moment is when somebody asks you, what did you do in the pandemic? You've got to have an answer. You've got to be doing something, whether you're volunteering, whether you're creating something from scratch, whether you and your work colleagues, if you're just at home, um, cook up something. Think of a project you've always wanted to do. Now's the moment. Companies really need young, imaginative, creative, tech-savvy people to step up and say, hey, you know, we could be doing this. We could be doing that. And I suspect that in many, many organizations, even quite traditional ones, they will get more of a hearing than they've ever had before. I mean, I sometimes work with some of the big banks and even those, you know, which are not famous for their agility, let's be honest, even those are kind of finding pockets of innovation and energy that they never knew they had before. Now, this could sound a little, um, I don't know, it may sound a little like a Walt Disney fantasy, right? There's a pandemic and everybody's having a ton of fun. You know, this could sound a bit extreme. Of course, there are other people who are traumatized, who are sick, who've lost people that they love. But, but um, that's equally, that's this is a moment for maximum resilience. I agree. I agree. There's a, there's a question which actually goes pretty much to what you just uh, said. So there are a lot of companies really, and a lot of leaders really hesitate to change, to do that twist, to be creative, to leverage their assets in a more creative way, uh, as you're suggesting. So could it be that they just, they simply don't have much to offer to the world in a way that's their fear? It's their fear and I think it's their reality. I mean, I work with one retailer at the moment um, and I have to say, I don't see any relevance to their business today. I think that if you, you know, if they sat down seriously and mapped the ecosystem that they inhabit and asked themselves, what is it that they can do, no one else can do that the customer, the market really values, they have no answer. And I suspect there are quite a lot of companies like that. And it doesn't give me any pleasure saying so. But since the financial crisis, instead of changing, all they've done is cost cutting. You know, they laid off people, they streamlined everything until they are exactly like everybody else in their market. They're cheaper, they're faster, they're no better, they're no more relevant, and they have nothing new to offer. And I think those companies will fail. But if you have nothing to lose, as you just say, right? What's then stopping you from going full speed into testing, into trying things out, into putting a different glasses on if you want and looking at your own assets, but also opening up 
and seeing where might there be a business that I can tap into that's not my core right now, but in collaboration, in cooperation with younger companies, tech driven. And that brings back the question or the second question as a leader today. We used to become leaders based on functional expertise. We were great at something and that's why we were climbing up. How do we become great leaders in understanding people, in enabling people, in getting the best out of people, providing a platform? Well, I think the first thing to do is ask everybody. I think one of the biggest mistakes I see companies in crisis make is to think, well, I need to get my senior leadership team in a big huddle and somehow between us, we're going to figure everything out. Um, it's very well understood. You know, there's always more knowledge at the edge than at the center. You know, you have to ask people to, to tell you what you should be doing and be prepared with some humility to listen to it. My hunch is, because I've seen this in so many companies, in every country, in every sector, companies that are absolutely packed full of more junior people who have a passion for the business, tons of ideas, and cannot get themselves heard. You know, I wrote a whole business about, I wrote a whole book about this, basically, willful blindness. You know, the ideas are there, the knowledge is there, but they're too far down the, the hierarchy or they're too afraid of saying what's not, you know, the conventional wisdom. You have to really reach out to these, to everyone in the company and say, okay, we're in a different place now. Nobody is an expert in how to manage through a pandemic. So we need everybody's ideas and everybody's thoughts. And interestingly, you know, this is exactly what Risto Silasma did when Nokia went through its great existential crisis. And people often think, well, you know, they just failed. You know, they lost the handset business and that was that. The fact of the matter is that um, Nokia is now one of the three most important internet infrastructure providers in the world. If you send anything through the internet, you know, everything we're doing right now, a third of it goes through Nokia systems and Nokia equipment. And the way that they can radically reposition themselves was by creating an environment in which all ideas were welcome, where everybody could argue about everything because it was understood that they were doing that for the good of the company, and where they looked at diff you know, dozens of different scenarios every day. This was kind of scenario planning on speed. And that's how they turned what looked like a failure into an extraordinary success. Yeah, and in addition to that, by the way, um, a lot of the tech people out of that Nokia hub started some amazing tech companies, and there is a whole cluster around that right now. But let's let's do one thing. We've been now we've been giving a lot of credit to young people. We we need to get it from the edge, and we need to to enable them, and we need to understand them. I'll put a it's not won't be a very famous one, but I'll put a monkey on the shoulder of young people. And I'll say, when I started working, my last question in an interview definitely was not, what's my work-life balance? So I guess I'm asking, how hungry are young people today? And is this a European problem? Is this a global problem? If you ask some of the venture capitalists outside of Europe, they say, that's a pretty much European problem. So how, how do we, are young people hungry? work with are very hungry, um, you know, partly because, you know, it, in all honesty, they know that the way that we have built the bit that, you know, generations before us built the, um, the business environment has enormous problems with it, right? So first of all, it's wrecking the planet. That's not a trivial problem. We have got to fix that. And they know that more than anybody because they're going to live through the consequences if we don't. So are they motivated? You bet they're motivated. The second thing I'd say is maybe they understand a lot about productivity that other people don't. You know, we've been doing productivity experiments and studies since 1888, the Zeiss Lens Laboratory, which showed and continues to show ever since 
that human productivity taps out at about 40 hours a week. Now, that doesn't mean you can't work people harder or that they can't really deliver in a crunch. But long term, you just burn people out. And if you think they're just commodities and you can throw them out and replace them, that's fine. But the truth is, if you want people to keep having ideas and keep being creative and innovative, they have to have a life to inform those ideas. You know, whenever you look at, a, at an entrepreneur and say, where did the idea come from? Guess what? It's almost never sitting at a desk in front of an Excel spreadsheet. It's being out in the world and saying, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. You know, um, I remember talking to Jack Dorsey about how he came up with the idea for Square. He was in a craft market in Texas because a friend of his is a potter. And he saw that the potter couldn't take um, a credit card from a customer. He could only take cash and the object that he was selling was too expensive. So he's not getting his idea by going through the same old boring market research that everybody else goes through. He's out in the world seeing the things that don't work and thinking, I can do that better. So this time away from the desk or the office is not necessarily time away from work. I think we need a much broader imaginative concept of how ideas are born and where they come from. And I can tell you, I can't, I mean, I have interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs. I've never met anybody who said I had this great idea when I was sitting at my desk. And by the way, I agree. And by the way, I don't know many entrepreneurs who can't wait to go back to normal because it's it's in the DNA to see what's the new normal. And I think that's something that we should be a bit more open to and not right away fall back into old patterns just because we know them. There's a question uh, that just came in. So young people might have great ideas, but often little experience. How do you balance fresh ideas in this experience, which is necessary for success? It's a great question. Um, my husband, who's a scientist, is always saying, you know, ideas are cheap. And he's right. It costs you nothing to have ideas. It costs you everything to put them into action, right? And I think, you know, I think that those, you know, young or old, those who aren't entrepreneurial by nature or who may not be great idea generators, nevertheless, the idea generators need people with experience to stand shoulder to shoulder with them to take the idea from a vague idea into execution. And I have seen that work, you know, cross-generationally magnificently. I mean, when I started my first tech company in the States, my CTO had been the recipient of the first email that was ever sent, you know, in Cambridge, Massachusetts at BBN. So, you know, to call him an internet veteran is just, you know, a wild understatement. Um, I was a very much a uh, tech newbie and we had this fantastic working relationship. You know, he was older than me in tech years and older than me in, you know, in person years. But, you know, I knew how to turn what he had invented into something commercial and he knew how to make, you know, the technology work. These kinds of pairings, especially between people who are not exactly the same, They can be tremendously productive and they're also very exciting for both groups. I mean, I also worked with an amazing construction company where they actually paired the more junior with the more senior because what they found is the senior guys learned a lot about new tech and different ways of thinking. And the junior people learned more about kind of process and how you actually deliver something on time. So I really don't buy this idea that, well, it has to be one way or the other way. You know, the best work is done by very rich, often very contentious collaboration. And I also think that there is a time for everything. So if you let in the very beginning, if you're too strict about ideas and not exploring them and not testing them, you won't get anywhere. Well, the more mature you go and the more investment it requires, I think the, the stricter you need to be, is it really working or not? So I think step by step, you need to shift from more from starting with the creativity and everything is allowed going into this is what we're doing. This is what What are we good at? And that's the focus now. And I think there it's extremely valuable and helpful to have experienced people who know when to turn and when to shift this. 
I, I completely agree. And it's it's interesting because I work with a lot of entrepreneurs still and they'll come up with an idea and I'll give them all the reasons, you know, why it won't work. And what I'm interested in is do they come back, right? Do they come back with the answers? Because this is always going to happen. There, You know, although there are fairy tales told about I had an idea and I woke up the next day and I was a millionaire, right? You know, the truth is there's that long, hard slog where people are very doubtful, very skeptical. And if you regard those uh, people as not on your side, you're wrong because they're helping you understand your idea and how it might become a reality much better. So the critic is your friend at that point and may save you from investing years in something that for you know all sorts of reasons wouldn't work. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm kind of, famous for my belief that disagreement is a gift, you know, but the people who, who tell you why not, if you regard that as a gift, gift rather than a criticism, you'll learn a lot faster and save yourself from quite a lot of big mistakes. So I've, I've asked, I know that we're coming, uh, that we're running a bit out of time, but I've asked a lot of my friends while we were in the middle of this COVID crisis, I told them, just a few weeks ago, everyone was pretty clear what's going to happen in the next year, right? Everyone had planned out some weddings and parties and graduations and business-wise and so on. We knew exactly how the next quarter will look like and then the following quarter and so on. How does your next year look like? What are you up to in the next 12 months? And where are you? What are you doing? I have no idea. <laughs> Um, I mean, in theory, my book comes out in the States in September. Maybe I'll be there. Maybe I won't. I have no idea. Um, I mean, I do lots of other things, you know, so I, I mean, I, so I will continue to promote the book through whatever media are available to me. I'll continue to do wonderful events like this. I'll continue to have the very rich relationship with a lot of my readers that I do. Um, I'll continue to work with entrepreneurs and with really big corporations and try to get them to kind of understand their value to each other. Um, and I'm going to start a new book and it's, um, and I won't tell you what it's about, but I will tell you that it is nothing to do with anything we've just discussed. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of, um, artists and writers and poets and musicians and so on. And the reason, I mean, there are many reasons, but one of them is this. When you start a book, you really have no idea what it's going to be. You have a sense that I want to move in that direction and you start reading and talking to people and that kind of thing. It's very like starting a, starting up a business. And, and you do some experiments and they don't quite work and then you do some other experiments and they work a little better so you move a bit more in that direction. And the uncertainty is actually what makes it interesting. The uncertainty is what makes it worth doing. Because if I knew, oh, the book is going to be exactly like this, you know, there's a template and I just pour my content into it. And, you know, it's going to be exactly this number of words. And this is what's going to be in every chapter. And this is what the audience is going to be. And this is what the reception will be. If I knew all that before I started, why bother doing it? Right? So this book may turn out to be a, one of the books that I fall in love with and never finished. It may turn out to be the best book I've ever written. It may turn out to be something completely different because halfway through I changed my mind. Um, so all I know is um, I'll be working on something. That's my plan. Very detailed plan. It's a very good plan. It's a very good plan. <laughs> but we, we both don't miss waking up at 4 a.m. to jump on a plane. Here are a few questions. Um, if innovation comes with youth, why does research show that a 40-year-old startup founder twice as likely to found a successful startup uh, than a 25-year-old? I think it's all very relative. As I'm 39, I think 40 is very young. It's it's a it's a fantastic young age. So it's it's not about it's not about age. It's absolutely true that I think with experience and when you're in your late 30s or early 40s, you have for sure still the creativity, and that's not dependent on age. But you're pairing it with experience. I think uh, we didn't mean that only young people are, are creative and innovative. Okay. Having ideas doesn't depend on age. So how would you enable people of all ages to have ideas and put them into business no matter what level they're at? That's a very good one. 
So I'm really glad somebody raised this because I think there's this cliche that successful entrepreneurs are generally um, sort of late adolescent white boys. Right? None of the data suggests that. I remember um, interviewing Peter Drucker's wife who started her first business at the age of 88. And she said he was no help at all except with the tax return, right? So, you know, you can start a business at any age. You know, my father started his first business in his 60s. Um, I think one reason that people that have more experience are more successful is they have more contacts, they have more expertise, they understand how business is done. So there's just a lot they don't have to learn. And I think that stands them in really good stead. But I also think that part of being, you know, having ideas is, as I said before, it's about being in the market and looking around and saying, what does it work very well? And I think that anybody can do that at any age. Absolutely. And, you know, and I've, and I've seen young people start businesses and I've also seen middle-aged people start businesses and old people. It's quite interesting actually, because similarly, there is no age profile for scientists who make important breakthroughs. Because, you know, people are always trying to make science more efficient. So they think, well, what's the profile of the breakthrough scientists? We've got to find these people. And the truth is people are creative at all ages. And you, you know, you look at Matisse at the end of his life, you look at Beethoven at the end of his life. I mean, people are creative, are capable of creativity up to the very last minute they're alive. So I just don't buy this idea that age is is the critical factor at all. I think what's I much more important. More. Couldn't agree more. It's us who start putting people. people help you. you have to have people who help you. But it is us in corporate life who start putting people in boxes and saying, you're creative, you're analytical. So couldn't agree more. There's yeah. another one. What are your thoughts on the forces that can meaningfully change culture to reward resilience in the short run, even when the probability of a crisis is very low? Hmm. Good one. It's a very, it's Leave a very, one you. yeah. Um, I mean, I think external crises obviously have a huge impact i think that disruptors often have a very huge impact um, one of the things i often ask my more conventional clients is you here's your choice you're either going to be disrupted by people outside the business or you can disrupt yourself inside the business so which is it going to be because you can see that you can't stay the way you are. So are you going to take control of your fate or just wait for it to happen to you? And, you know, sometimes they get that. A few of them really do seriously think nobody will ever, ever, ever replace them. And God bless them. You know, maybe they're right. It would scare me to death <laughs> to think that. Um, what are the other forces for change? Um, definitely, I would say women and minorities because they bring a very very different lens to corporate cultures and i think in the past we've thought businesses have thought well we'll let women in as long as they don't change anything and now i think the issue is we have to let women in and ethnic minorities in because they're tremendous drivers of change because they bring different perspectives and mindsets And I think the move from diversity, which is still too slow and not energetic enough, has in it this huge potential to really revivify lots of otherwise rather stale organizations. But I think it's also, I mean, it has to be accepted that diversity, that's what I'm, what I'm seeing right now. Uh, I mean, compared to my previous uh, work, We work is so diverse because they are creative people, architects, they're designers, they're construction people, you know, they're business people. It is so damn hard to align everyone. But the outcome is much better than same people sitting in a room. You tend very quickly to agree with people who are exactly thinking, educated in the same way as you do. But there's just very little outcome, I think. So couldn't agree more. It only takes much better, much greater leadership to run a really diverse organization. 
And it takes leadership that is probably more humble and more adventurous. But the other thing that I think is really important and underestimated is it takes a higher ambition. That what really aligns people is not, you know, these kind of small, short-term, tiny targets. What really aligns people is a, a big ambition that matters. And when people join a company because there is a, a big ambition, much more than a stretch goal, right? We're talking a really big ambition that matters to the world. That becomes a kind of magnet that aligns people who may be very different in themselves, but really care about this vision. So one of the things I've written about in the past is the team that came up with the first ever alternative to CFCs. Now, at the time when CFCs were banned by the Montreal Protocol, nobody knew if there, if you could, if there was any substitute. Nobody knew if this multi-billion-dollar business would just sail away and never be seen again. And the group that really cracked this, you know, they just had a couple of rules. One was, we're not going to set, you know, we're not going to um, cheat on quality. The goal is the best imaginable, not the easiest, the best. And the rule, the operating rule was everybody contributes because since we don't know where the answer is going to come from, we need every kind of expertise, intelligence, and creativity. Damn. And that ambition galvanized this wildly divergent group of people and kept them going despite the uncertainty that it might actually be an impossible task. So I think we really underrate the the magnetic pull of a very meaningful ambition and we too often call it a purpose and what we really mean is a 10 percent growth per year you know which is completely uninspiring that's a very that's a very strong one and uh, i can own yeah you can't you can't make up for purpose you when you when you see and experience purpose then you know it but you can't make up for it there are two great questions um, what kind of gender differences did you experience in the past among entrepreneurs and which changes do you expect in the future? I'll let you go first. <laughs> well, when I became an entrepreneur, a tech entrepreneur in the US, I, my company was backed uh, by an investor who had a portfolio of 40 companies of which I was the only female CEO founder. Um, when I took a week off to have my second child and I came back, his first question was, how was your vacation? Because he'd never even noticed that I was pregnant. <laughs> and a number of my, you know, female entrepreneur friends, I cannot tell you how many times they've been asked by potential investors, would you be prepared to step aside for a male CEO? if we invested in your company. So I would say, um, yes, it's very different. There are very, very few uh, tech entrepreneurs who are female. There are more than there used to be, but there are very few. I would say that, I mean, when you look at how little of VC funding they get, which I think now is about 5%, yes, there is bias. Yes, we are underestimated, undervalued and marginalized. And yes, it sucks. And will it change? Yes, but not fast enough for me. I have I have experienced something which is not very favorable for um, for men, which is, and I don't know, Margaret, if you shared that experience, but when founders are under pressure, they tend to look for a very quick solution. And it can be also a lose-lose. Well, female try and see how could collaboration, cooperation lead to a win-win. Not being blue-eyed, but I, I can see this if it's on the business side, if it's a legal dispute, it very often, you know, kind of goes into this, if I can't have it, he shouldn't have it. Well, uh, I've seen this play out very differently with, uh, with female leaders. Um, there are a lot of questions popping in. Sorry, I'll just, if you know the answer, you have already stopped listening. And in times like uh, like this, we need leaders to listen. So how do we help managers to stop having all the answers? That's a great one. 
It's so funny. I once mentored um, the head of a gigantic business unit in Switzerland, and he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. And one day I said to him, look, I want you to go into your next meeting and promise me you will not say a word. <laughs> and he looked at me like this is some kind of torture, you know. But he was a very, you know, he always did what he was told. So he did that. And he came, you know, afterwards, I said, so what happened? He said, it was really interesting. I said, yeah, why? He said, well, because obviously everybody expected me to give them the answer. Uh-huh. And what happened when you didn't? Well, they came up with their own answers. Uh-huh. And they were much better. <laughs> and, you know, that one experience changed his whole behavior. Partly he stopped going to lots of the meetings, which was much better for him and for everybody else. But it also gave him a lot more respect for the people that he'd been smart enough to hire. And um, and taught him that if he, actually if you say to yourself, and I've done this myself when I was in a company where I thought, Margaret, you're just talking too much. Um, if you say, I'm not going to say anything, you listen in a completely different way. And what you hear is much richer because you're not looking for that moment where you can just dive in and land your point. And I must say, I mean, all the leaders I work with and mentor, I just this is a core thing. Just go in, promise you'll say nothing unless there's something really fundamental that only you can say. And after that, shut up. Because either you've hired great people, in which case let them be great, or you haven't, in which case you have a different problem, you should get out of the meeting and start hiring some better people. Yeah, very well said. Um, there's another one. Let's talk about specific industry. How will the consulting landscape evolve and perhaps be disrupted in the months and years ahead? Um, look, I think um, there's not much, not much change in terms of a crisis. A crisis is actually good for the consulting industry, but I think when it comes down to is quality. So you can't be an expert. I think there were too many companies um, in good times when it's sunny, everyone can do everything. And I think right now when it's really tough and you need to be very precise in what your recommendation is, what your commitment as well as a firm is to be a real partner to the companies you consult, I think that will be a key differentiator. And obviously, I'm a bit biased, but business building and just being a real business partner and build businesses with your clients, I think will be uh, a key thing going forward for the consulting industry. A question for both of us, how will the predicted increase in work from home challenge leadership? And would you agree that talent becomes more available if companies offer more work from home options? Mm. I think this is really interesting because I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, various people said to me, oh, do you think, you know, do you think we'll just all be working from home? And once people understand that it works, that's all we'll ever do. And as usual, it was kind of framed as a binary thing. Either we're all in the office or we're all at home. And binary questions always a sure sign that, you know, it's the wrong question. Um, I think part of what's happened in this period is organizations have learned that you can get a great deal done with people working from home and that flexibility isn't a code word for um, not working. It may be a code word for working much more efficiently. So I think the level of trust in the nature of working from home has very usefully gone up. I yeah. think also people have started to realize that the meaning of work when done in complete isolation is much harder to internalize. That I get a lot of my sense of meaning in work from other people, from working alongside them, from you know sharing the victories and the disasters, that I learn a lot about myself from other people and I build relationships, you know, of course, partly online, but not only online. So I think some kinds of jobs and some kinds of individuals be much happier being done from home entirely. I think lots of people will be eager to get back into offices and see their pals on a more regular basis. So what I hope is that we come to something that's much more blended, um, can be more specific to individuals. 
And what I really hope, the key thing, is that people understand that working from home means working from home. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, look, what we see is, I, I like I like the word blended um, because I agree. What we see is a lot of what we called before traditional school companies, they try to push everyone back into the office, pretending as if nothing. Yeah. Um, but we also do see a lot of flexibility in the terms of companies do realize that it is not fun and not based best use of your time to commute four hours a day. So they start to create flexibility around hubs, around a town, around, you know, around different offices. So that's something that we definitely see. What we also see is there are certain functions who do not need to be in the office every day. So the flexibility around how many days can I work from where, depending on, am I on a project group? Am I working on a product on any service with a different group of people, which might require me to regroup twice a week or three times, but two days work from home. That is definitely increasing and will increase going forward. And then lastly, I think it's a learning process for all of us. It is weird. It is simply weird to be for eight weeks in a spot. So what we did is we told our own people, just create a kind of office atmosphere. Create your little office hub, you know, if it's a small flat, if it's a big house, whatever, but just create a place where you feel like I'm talking now to you. I'm not, I'm not sitting at home and chilling. This is a, this is a conversation. So it is a learning experience for people how to jump between the worlds. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it works out really well to have that flexibility and not to have to show up. That's what no one needs. Having to show up does make sense. But I think, I mean, you must understand this better than most people in the world. You know, the value that people get from each other. Because, you know, part of the big premise of WeWork is it's not I work, is it? It's we work, right? And actually bumping into other people who might not be in your company, but are working on cool stuff and that kind of thing. So there's a profoundly motivating social aspect to work that I think we would we would we all really need and um, yeah. miss. Yeah. But I think that um but I think that you're you're right, you know, this thing that, well, it's 8 30 and you're not at your desk. Where have you been? You know, teaching, treating people. I mean, I think there's a lot about traditional office life that is very infantilizing. This is yeah. what we don't need anymore. The traditional. Yeah. That is what we don't need anymore. Because I think we really miss social interaction. We really miss to be, you know, it's very nice. I have to say it's very nice to have this chat with you, but it would be yeah. even nicer because I am maybe in that respect old school to sit across a table and to, to have a face-to-face -face conversation. So we definitely exactly. miss that. Well, it's funny because in my house, we have my husband who's a scientist. He's got his office. And we've got my daughter who's, you know, who's running this huge poetry project and she's got her office and I have my office, you know, and we kind of meet occasionally for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. You know, how's it going? We give each other some advice and then we go back to work. You know? And it's, um, you know, it's lovely. You're in a much better place uh, than we are. My wife and I are hiding in different offices in order not to be responsible for homeschooling for the last eight weeks. <laughs> I have a lot of sympathy with you. <laughs> Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. This was an amazingly inspiring, optimistic talk. I have one question for you, Margaret. Is optimism teachable? Oh, that's so interesting. Um, I, I mean, it's interesting. I, I don't know if it's teachable or if it's, it's teachable with luck, if you like. So I've had quite a, a, a many, many, many years argument with my son, who used to be very pessimistic. And, um, and I would argue, you know, because I am just a, a, an impossible pessim uh, optimist, really. And I think that he's kind of gently moving in my direction, you know, which is he keeps being quite buoyant all the way through the lockdown. He was in Berlin. You know, and he's a musician, so being locked down is not fun, but being in Berlin is fun in, in any circumstance. Munich but, too. <laughs> yes, but, in, but, um, but he's becoming more optimistic as he gets a stronger sense of himself. 
So I think, you know, very often you find that adolescents are quite pessimistic. And then as they get more sense of their own capacity, they develop more optimism. Hmm. But I think it's very important for the adults around them to encourage and sustain that because it's definitely the case. Again, I've written about this in, in my latest book. Optimists do better in life, you know, because they become people who aren't, don't give up in front of problems. They find ways either to solve them or to get around them. You know, they're fixers. They don't, they're not optimists because they think everything will be fine. I don't have to do anything. They think everything will be fine if I do something, right? So I think we can teach optimism by example and by patience and um, by showing people that they often have more resources than they may see immediately around them as resources. Thank you so much. Mm. Nikki and Margaret, you made my day. You, made, you gave us a wonderful interview. You gave us so much advice. Thank you so much. I, I, I really, I, it's, I'm sad that we stop now because I could hear forever. And I hope I will see, we all will see you soon in person. Thank you for coming to this show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Cheers.